at this time, we are going to uh, bring up Dr. Paul Offit. Where did I, I just saw him. Where are you? Thank you so much. Um, talking about the Philadelphia measles epidemic of 1991. Now, this is someone who is accustomed to talking to medical experts and medical journalists, and um, he's one of us. We're going to show him a lot of love because bringing together science and the need for reason and how this advances all of humanity is what we can all agree on doing. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Offit. Uh, you may, if you, if you want the hand so this, this. Hi. Um, I was asked a couple weeks ago, actually, to if I would be willing to come here and speak about a book that just came out a couple weeks ago called Bad Faith, When Religious Belief Undermines Modern Medicine. Um, the reason that I wrote this book is because I lived through the 1991 Philadelphia measles epidemic. This was an epidemic in our city um, that over a three-month period uh, caused 1,400 people to get measles. Um, nine children died. Five children died in a 10-day period. Um, the city was in a panic. I mean, there were uh, schools that canceled trips to our city. And this epidemic centered on two fundamentalist churches. One was the Faith uh, um, Tabernacle Church in North Philadelphia. The other one was called the First Century Gospel Church. I mean, both of these churches not only didn't believe in vaccination. And remember, in 1991, there had been a measles vaccine around for about 30 years. They didn't believe in medical care. So they didn't give intravenous fluids for dehydration. They didn't give oxygen for, uh, for children who had measles pneumonia. And the mortality rate of children who got measles in those two churches was 1 in 35. That is higher than any mortality rate in any developing world country, then or now. So, so that, that sort of, um, it scarred me, frankly, I mean, to watch these children um, die needlessly and sort of caused me to look more closely at this. And, and, um, and so um, I wrote a book about, in, in, in large part, about faith healing. Um, focusing on the roughly 25 sects in the United States, Christian science being most prevalent, um, that choose prayer instead of antibiotics for bacterial meningitis, or prayer instead of insulin for diabetes, or um, prayer instead of bronchodilators for asthma, or instead of anti-seizure medicines for, for epilepsy. Um, but but it, it's also, in the book, I sort of go beyond faith healing to look at groups like Jehovah's Witnesses who choose, who may choose not to give uh, life-saving blood transfusions to their children. And then more recently, and this is certainly something we experience in our hospital, and anybody who's in the, from the Northeast will know about this, the Metzitzah ritual, which is a um, practice by ultra-Orthodox Jewish moyles. Moyers are the, are the people that do ritual circumcisions. This particular ritual called Metzitzah Bepeh um, and involves more than 10,000 ch children, babies, um, every year in the United States, occurs when the circumcision is performed. Instead of cleaning off the, uh, the open wound with uh, a sterile gauze, the moyle actually sucks the blood off with his mouth. Um, what that does is it, it, uh, it can introduce herpes simplex virus, uh, which can cause uh, either permanent brain damage or death, and has in roughly 17 children, primarily in places like Brooklyn, New York, Pikesville, Maryland, and uh, Lakewood, New Jersey. So, so that, that's uh, sort of the focus of the book. I'll read sort of one um, story, which is a, a, a yet another Philadelphia story um, that was, happened uh, certainly when I was at, 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 at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. In 1997, two-year-old Michael Heilman was playing in the backyard when his mother heard him scream. She ran out to find he had stepped on a piece of glass, his right foot bleeding. Michael's father, Dean, immediately cleaned the wound and wrapped his son's foot in a towel but the bleeding didn't stop. So Dean rewrapped the wound in gauze surrounded by a disposable diaper. Again, the bandage quickly soaked with blood. That night, Michael couldn't sleep, crying and vomiting. The next morning, the bandage was again rewrapped using a heavier fabric, but the bleeding continued. Then instead of calling a doctor, the Howmans called Charles Reinert, pastor of Faith Tabernacle Congregation, and asked him to pray for their son. Later, when asked why she had chosen prayer instead of medical attention, Susan Howland said, when you're sick, you pray and ask the Lord to help heal you. The cut continued to bleed. Now for more than 12 hours, Michael spiraled downward. He became progressively more listless, occasionally crying out in pain. After bleeding for more than 19 hours, Michael Howland died in his mother's arms. An autopsy, shown he, an autopsy showed he had lost more than half his total blood volume. Michael Heilman had hemophilia, a disease that can be treated with blood clotting proteins and a problem that should have been obvious to the Heilmans as their son had suffered frequent and se severe bruising throughout his young life. 
Dr. Catherine Mano, a hemophilia specialist at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, said she had never seen a child die from a cut. I think, I think one of the things that, that um, struck me in all this is that when we see children in our hospital who are medically neglected, um, it's invariably um, in parents of limited resources who, frankly, don't show much love for their children, but that's not these parents. I mean, these parents love their children um, and, and believe that they're doing what, what is best for them um, by praying. If you ask them the question, and we got a chance to do this in, in 1991, why did you make this choice? I mean, why did you choose not to treat him? They would argue they were treating him. They were treating him by prayer. And so trying to understand the sort of spectrum of, of how a parent comes to make that choice, uh, you know, we. Um, I mean, uh, uh, sort of the obvious thing, the seduction of charismatic leaders, certainly Charles Reinert was a charismatic leader in, in, at the Faith Tabernacle Church in our, in our city. Um, and, you know, Mary Baker Eddy certainly was a charismatic leader for Christian scientists, that probably being the biggest of the faith healing sects. And people like, you know, Jim Jones from, People's, from the People's Temple or David Koresh from the Branch Davidians or Marshall Applewhite from Heaven's Gate are all well um, noted. And then there's the, sort of the obvious choice to literally interpret the Bible, um, um, the, the fear of hell, the seduction of heaven. But, but the thing that I struggled the most with in this was trying to understand where does one reasonably cross the line from a deeply held religious belief to a dangerous delusion. And, and the person I, I focused on and talked to at some length uh, in this book is a guy named Larry Parker. He, he wrote a book called We Let Our Son Die, which may sound like a mea culpa. It was the opposite of that, actually. It was very much a tribute to what he believed was his and his wife's uh, continued show of faithfulness in a setting where his eldest son, Wesley, uh, had type 1 diabetes. Now, what was interesting about Parker, as distinct from um, from other faith healing parents were two things. One, he was part of a mainstream church in Barstow, California. He was not part of a faith healing church. Two, he was medically quite sophisticated. I mean, he understood about his, what his son's illness meant. He'd been giving him insulin for years. He knew exactly what the signs and symptoms would be of giving his son too much insulin or too little insulin. Um, and yet he decided one day that his son should not have to suffer this lifelong chronic illness, that his faithfulness, his, Larry's faithfulness should be rewarded uh, by prayer. And so he, he chose to pray for his son's diabetes to be gone. And over the next period of the next three days, he watched as his son slipped into a diabetic a ketoacidotic a coma and died. He and his wife and their prayer group prayed for that uh, to happen. Um, then what he did was he, he decided that during a funeral service, a funeral service that was attended by more than 200 people, that he was going to resurrect his son. And, and there were the, enormous numbers of media requests from across the country, including people like Regis Philbin, who uh, wanted to attend to see this uh, resurrection, which, you know, spoiler alert for those of you who haven't read the book, uh, didn't happen, actually. But, um, <laughs> What, what, uh, what he then did was when his, his son um, was buried, he um, refused to attend the funeral because he believed that like Jesus, his son would also be resurrected uh, from the dead. And when, when um, that too didn't happen, he, he and his wife were arrested for murder. Their, their charge was later reduced to uh, felony uh, uh, um, child endangerment and felony manslaughter. Um, like all parents, frankly, who are, are, uh, do what he did, he never spent uh, a day in jail, and, and I'll get to that, so, so, which was also interesting to me, because it's not just that parents let this happen, it's that we let it happen. I mean, legally, we let this happen. We didn't used to let this happen. I mean, you can't do this in Canada. You can't do this in England. If you, if you choose prayer instead of, of antibiotics or bacterial meningitis, you will go to jail, and your children will be put in foster care. And that is also the way it worked in the United States in the... In the I mean, that's also the way that it worked in the United States um, in the early 20th century, but that changed in the 1970s, uh, interestingly. Um, it was a time when there was increasing recognition of child abuse, and so uh, Hubert Humphrey had an act called the Child Abuse Protection and Treatment Act, or CAPTA. So the government was willing now to spend 
hundreds of millions of dollars to recognize, prevent, and treat child abuse. Now, there were two prominent Christian scientists in Richard Nixon's administration, because this was Nixon's, ultimately, is the one who had to sign off on this program, who saw that there was an uncomfortable light that was about to be shown on their religion. Because now, I mean, Christian scientists believe in faith healing. Now, they feared that, that with this increasing recognition of child abuse, that this would be seen for what it was, which is uh, medical neglect and abuse. And so they said that you cannot get a penny of federal money unless your state has a, a religious exemption to child abuse and neglect laws. And so as a consequence, all 50 states then put in that law. Now, now six states have since overturned that, but essentially 44 states have some sort of religious exemption to child abuse and neglect because of those two Christian scientists that were prominent members of Nixon's administration. The older people in this audience are going to remember, are going to know these names. One of them, but both of them, frankly, months after they, they put that codicil in this in, in CAPTA, spent, uh, went to jail for their role in the Watergate scandal. One was uh, Nixon's chief of staff, Bob Halderman. The other was his chief domestic advisor, John Ehrlichman. Um, the, the, what I'm, one thing I want to talk about, and this is probably exactly not the group to talk about it in front of, but what the hell, I'll do it anyway, because I'm looking to expand my circle of hate. Right now it's just anti-vaccine people, and, and that's not enough for me. Um, I, I am what you are. I mean, I'm, I'm an atheist, but um, when I, I dealt... When, when, I, when I dealt with... Um, it's funny, my family is deeply religious, so they wouldn't have clapped to that, but... <laughs> Um, you know, when, when, when I, I really wanted to try and understand this from the parents' standpoint, I did. I mean, when we dealt with those parents at our hospital, um, because ultimately it came to a point and it was so bad that we were able to get uh, court orders to forcibly hospitalize and eventually forcibly vaccinate children. It's probably the only example of compulsory vaccination in the United States history, but because it was that bad. You know, they all said the same thing. Jesus was my doctor. And so I, I wanted to try and see it their way. I did. And so I read the entire New Testament for the purpose of writing this book. And, and I, I guess I came to this conclusion. Independent of whether you believe that there is a supreme being, or independent of whether you believe that Jesus was the Son of God, was a deity, or independent of whether you believe that the four Gospels, at least the four Gospels that made it into the final canon, were in any way a reflection of the person who was called Jesus of Nazareth, his life or work, because obviously the Gospels were written many decades after um, he, he is, is uh, said to have uh, uh, been crucified. When those Gospels were written, uh, Child abuse was the crying vice of the Roman Empire. I mean, abandonment was common, infanticide was common. Children didn't matter. I mean, Hippocrates, who lived about 400 years before you know, Jesus was claimed to have lived, um, never mentions children in his writings about how one ethically deals with families because children didn't matter. They were property. They were no different than slaves. But if you, if you read through the New Testament, that's not the way Jesus is described. He's described as someone who cared about children, right? I mean, suffer me the children for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. The, the, and the one line that can see, because this is the group you want to quote scripture in front of, right? Am, am I right? Have I nailed this group? Because it's sort of know your audience, and that's how I see this. But I mean, the one line which was in Matthew, is in Matthew 25, 40 was, verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto the one of the least of my brethren, you have done it unto me. And I feel like you could have inscribed that on the entranceway of every children's hospital in the world. So where do they get this notion that Jesus would be perfectly willing to watch children suffer the breathlessness of pneumonia or, or the pain of meningitis and do nothing? And, and I guess what really upset me the most in 1991 when this was all going down was where the hell was the church? I mean, it would have been nice if someone, and we had Anthony Bevilacqua in our, in our city who at that, in 1991, was promoted actually from um, bishop to cardinal. He was a leading voice. It would have been helpful if he stood up and said something like, this is not a Christian act. It honestly would have helped because for the rest of us, the public health people and the, the lawyers who were trying to deal with all this um, were really sort of flailing away out there. These are unreligious acts, and they shouldn't be given the legal protection of religion, frankly. I think that's what this boils down to. So, see that, that actually just, that's the whole theme of my book, actually, is, so now you don't have to read it. So it's, it's the, you know, that, that when you put children uh, unnecessarily in harm's way in the name of God, that it's not 
a religious act and shouldn't be legally seen as that. Um, but you know, um, these, the, 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 this is why legisla legislators don't touch this. I mean, in, in Pennsylvania, where certainly we suffered the Jerry Sandusky pedophilia scandal uh, uh, recently, that actually le uh, necessitated, or at least as far as our commonwealth was concerned, a real tightening of child abuse and neglect laws. But they never touched the religious exemptions of child abuse and neglect. I live in a state that has a religious exemption to bicycle helmets. I mean, I live in a state where you can adopt a child if you don't want to vaccinate them, that if you don't believe in vaccination, not that it's a belief system. So, so um, I'll close with just sort of this notion, which is the, um, this book. Oh, you know, I wanted to read, sorry, one section about Larry Parker, which I forgot to read, because this, this was sort of one thing that I struggled with. Remember, Parker was the guy who prayed for his son's uh, diabetes to be gone. In a more rational world, someone like Larry Parker might not be labeled with something as gentle as a personality disorder. I sort of went through those disorders before this paragraph. In my view, he would be considered psychotic, meaning possessing a distorted or non-existent sense of reality. Unfortunately, for people with strongly held religious beliefs, it's often difficult to know where to draw the line between faith and delusion. For example, Larry had believed that his son's physical deterioration was a trick played on him by Satan. Larry reasoned that Wesley wasn't really sick, he was well. The devil was testing Larry's faith by making it look like Wesley was sick. It's hard to label this kind of thinking as anything other than delusional, but many Americans believe that the devil roams the earth and that he works his deceptions. So in some ways, Larry Parker represents a cultural norm. The same can be said for Larry's belief that Wesley's funeral service was being held on holy ground, causing him to seek everyone to remove their shoes, or for his belief that God had sent an angel in the form of a bearded man to help with the resurrection. Many religions claim holy ground, and many people believe in angels and demons. Again, Larry Parker is far, far from alone. However, if Larry Parker's actions are to be considered psychotic, we would have to similarly label all those who participated in his delusion, including Lucky, who was his wife, her prayer group, and everyone who showed up at the funeral service hoping to see a resurrection. Even Lucky's lawyer, Leroy Simmons, reassured her during the trial that he too believed in faith healing. And we would also have to label a psychotic 50,000 Christian scientists and tens of thousands of Americans who comprise the 20 or so other sects that embrace faith healing. Furthermore, if we're going to call anyone who believes in resurrection psychotic, remember that R. Roberts, a popular evangelist, claims to have performed them. Although these resurrections surely never happened, no one rushed to put him in an institution after he made the claims. Indeed, many members of Roberts' congregation believed him. This is not to say that one couldn't reasonably label as psychotic all those who share the Parker's deluded beliefs in faith, healing, and resurrection. It's just that you get to a point where so many people share a certain belief that calling them all delusional becomes harder to do. So, so the, the book has an unlikely hero, and, and the unlikely hero is a woman named Rita Swan. You, you, some of you may know her, but she, um, she was, and I probably spent, I would say, 15 hours on the phone with Rita. I haven't met her yet, but I will in October when I go to Lexington, where she is now. But um, she, what makes her inter interesting and unusual is that she's a Christian scientist. She was raised by Christian scientists, um, and she married a Christian scientist. Um, she's brilliant. Um, she's really well-spoken and well-read. Uh, she got her PhD in English from, from Vanderbilt. Her husband, also a Christian scientist, got his PhD in mathematics, also from Vanderbilt. And, and yet when her son, her 15-month-old son Matthew, was, was, uh, was uh, str stricken with uh, bacterial meningitis, she prayed. And prayed and prayed and prayed for the 12 days it took for him to die of a treatable illness. Um, when, you, when you ask her about that, again, she says, I was treating him, I was praying, but, but unlike other Christian scientists, and, and also if you ask her about how um, she could allow this to happen, she said, you, you can't, can't understand how medically unsophisticated I was. I mean, I, I grew up without ever seeing a thermometer. I didn't know that a fever could equal infection. Just because I, and her thesis, I think, was on uh, Percy Shelley and British Romantic poetry when she got her PhD in, in Vanderbilt, just because I know... Um, British Romantic poetry, or my husband knows differential equations, doesn't mean that either of us knew a thing about medicine. I mean, it's amazing how they can compartmentalize that, how they could, could keep themselves away from any sort of medical information as they were instructed to do. Um, but in any case, after her son um, died, she had had it. She felt duped. And I think became one of the first people really to get on national television, in her case, the Phil Donahue show, and say that a major religion was a fraud. I mean, she said that I, I've been duped by this religion. Uh, my son died unnecessarily. 
Um, she called it, uh, I loved her phrase, was a fragile magic. And um, she has then devoted her life. The last few decades have been devoted by her to overturning religious exemptions to child abuse and neglect laws. Although, interestingly, she remains intensely religious. Um, she now has educated herself, obviously, about medicine and, um, and chooses modern medicine. So let me just read you sort of one section about her. An analogy to Rita Swan's story can be found in M. Night Shyamalan's 2004 movie, The Village, the story of an insular community united by fear. Brought together by the murder of loved ones, several Philadelphians decide to create a 19th century farming community in rural Pennsylvania. Solace, they believe, could be found by retreating into the past. To isolate the community from a world they fear, the elders create mythical monsters that are supposedly hiding in the woods, referred to as the things of which we do not speak. The monsters won't bother the villagers as long as the villagers don't enter the woods. As a consequence, no one enters or leaves the village. Then something happens that the elders hadn't anticipated. A young man is stabbed. When an infection develops, the only way to save him is with antibiotics. Unfortunately, the community has been created to mimic the late 1800s, a time before antibiotics. Knowing the monsters are a hoax, the elders allow one of the residents, a young woman, to travel through the woods and get the antibiotics they need. They pick her because she's blind, hoping that when she returns, she won't have realized the wealth of life-saving technologies on the other side. Religions that ask their followers to act against love, compassion, and reason use a similar tactic. Rita Swan was afraid to oppose her church and see a doctor because her church believed that doctors want, quote, to dethrone God, end quote, and are therefore evil. If she had sought out modern medicine, she would have been forced to confront the evil and worse, the anger of God or that evil and the anger of God. But Rita Swan wasn't blind. When she crossed the woods and entered the Wayne State University Medical Library and understood how she could have treated her son's illness, there was no going back. Even if it meant ostracism from a community she had known all her life, even if it meant challenging her notion of God. Swan's break with her church came when she realized that no God would ask a parent to let a child die in his name. Quote, I believe that the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath, said Swan. That's what Jesus says. So I think religion has to work. It has to bless people. And if it doesn't, if it causes pain, if it justifies cruelty, then it's something I don't want any part of. I think we have to be explicit in rejecting things that are cruel and unjust, whether they're religious or not. Religion has to serve the good of humanity, not the other way around. So Rita has spent her last few decades trying to overcome these laws. In, in five years after her son Matthew died, she created something called Children's Health Care as a Legal Duty or Child. She has worked tirelessly to try and uh, not allow parents to do what she could so easily do, um, which was to deny, deny her son uh, life-saving antibiotics. When you talk to her, she's, um, she is driven and she is relentless in part because she knows she is trying to fill a hole that can never be filled. Uh, you know, she let her son die and she has to live with that and there is no living with that and there is no peace from that. And that's why she is, will dry, do this, I think, until the day she dies. In fact, I mean, all, all of my royalties from the sale of this book are going to be donated to her, um, her organization. So. Thank you for your attention. Do I take questions? Can I? Okay. So uh, we have just a few minutes for a couple questions. Again, they end with a question mark. And um, we've got a mic here. So this gentleman here, you're standing right next to him, is the first hand I saw. Great talk, thank you for bringing reason and thank you for your charitable contributions to the reason that you're bringing. I agree with almost everything you said, almost. The question is why do you say that's not religious to have faith healing? It is the very essence of the religion that they are following. Jesus said it, let's stop the no true Christian argument. Yeah, good, good, good question. Here's what I would say. 
I am tired of watching legislators wimp out. That, that's the reason. And I think what I'm trying to offer in this book, I mean, it's, it would have been easy for me to, you know, to do what you know, Christopher Hitchens and Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris do and say religion is illogical and potentially harmful and leave it at that, preach to the choir. But, but what I have been so frustrated by, especially with the legislators in our state, Pennsylvania, is that they always hide behind religion. I mean, religion is politically dy political dynamite for them. I think if you can separate these things out and say that when you, that, 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 I mean, if you look at sort of Hobby Lobby or the, the results of the things that are going on in Indiana right now, it just strikes me that, 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 if, that, that religion at its best causes us to find that best part of ourselves, and religion at its worst causes us to find a reason to express the worst part of ourselves. And if we could just separate those two things out and let legislators act in a manner that protects, in my case, because I'm a child advocate, children, if we can just say this isn't religion, maybe that would help them be able to do something they seem to be wholly incapable of doing. It is remarkable to me that I live in a state where there are two faith healing churches where you know those children are not going to be getting antibiotics for their pneumonia or not be getting insulin for for diabetes, and every year, one to two children in our state die, and we do nothing about it. This was an idea for how to, how to make it easier for legislators to, to, uh, to feel they aren't acting against religion when they protect children. That's why. Uh, there was a woman up front. I worked uh, for a number of years as a librarian for a health region in Saskatchewan, and up there, First Nations, some of the First Nations people believe that sweet grass burning will heal them. Um, so they do that in the hospital. The patients are in the hospital and they can burn sweet grass, which permeates the entire building. So I'm just curious how you feel about those sort of issues where governments and, uh, are, are allowing alternative treatments that have not been scientifically proven to work. It's right. Uh -huh. Thank you. Yeah, I actually wrote a book called Do You Believe in Magic? The Sense and Nonsense of Alternative Medicine. I think, here's my feeling about this. Don't hurt children is my feeling. So if, if when people come into the hospital um, and they want to pray for a child, that's fine. Pray and give the antibiotics. Or in the case of an acute psychotic break where they want an exorcism to be performed by our chaplain, which I'm embarrassed to say at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia happens periodically, I'm fine with that as long as they, they do the exorcism and give the hell doll. You, you know, I mean, just don't, don't put the child in harm's way is all I'm saying. So if burning sweet grass doesn't, doesn't you know, set anything on fire, um, I'm fine. All right. You know, I, I'm very sorry we are completely out of time for questions.